Don't take this wrong, but I kind of want to give a disclaimer. <laughs> Remember, all I want to share with you, what I'm going to share with you this morning again is, is um, my thoughts. And these are, this is my research that I did to answer the prayer request that I have been having. And, and, and I'll tell you, because again, I went through the same, same process again of one to speak on something else this morning. And again, the Lord just moved me in a completely different direction. And you, you know what, Tony? Ever since Thomas came in his, his sermon on Sabbath morning, really did something to my heart and mind that, that, that brought me from the second coming of Christ, me being here, to the second coming of Christ and me being here. And now my mind and my thoughts are just in, in, in the signs all around us. And one of the reasons that I want to speak on this issue is because I've been getting um, text, text all week from um, a friend of mine in Israel. He went back to Israel. He's been texting me and texting me, and I said, why, Lord? Because, and uh, I want to just uh, share it with you. So the title of this morning's sermon is... Um, a world stirred with the spirit of war. Okay? So if you take a look at all the Bible prophecy websites, you will find the majority of them focusing on the literal nation of Israel. Are you not? Most of them they are. You know, people you talk to and, and everybody at work, when they hear, you know, the things going on in Israel or, or you, you, you see and you feel the support especially from the Christian community. You feel the support for Israel, you know? And if you look at this map, you know, this is the map of uh, Israel during the time of Jesus. You know, and, and, uh, and so you look at the map, you see Judah, Perea, Decapolis, Samaria, Galilee. Who, who was in this land? Who were the, who, who were the what was the population? It was mostly Jews, weren't they? It was all Jewish, for the most part. But going on, when you see these websites and you see all the support for Israel, that and and you hear all these stories, you know that Israel is going to change. They are, you know, you also hear this uh, misconception of the seven-year prophecy and all these things going on in Israel. So the question is, are they wrong? I will have to say they are completely wrong. And the reason there is was because we like to focus on physical things in life rather than on the spiritual. We like to touch and feel things rather than focus on worshiping God. How? In spirit and in truth. Is this issue with regards to Israel important during the end times? Well, I used to think different. I used to say, you know what? Why are you focused on Israel? You know, I mean, they're not going to convert. They're not going to be changed as you think. And, and, and I was being sarcastic and I say, well, if you're going to focus on Israel, then, then in order for that to happen, they're going to have to become a seven-day Adventist. You know, because pretty much we are spiritual Israel. So yes, focusing on Israel, this truth is very important. I want to read to you just a quick, a simple uh, um, quote that I found. And she titles it, The World Steered with the Spirit of War. She says that the world is steered with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of the prophecies will take place. I was shown the inhabitants of the earth in the utmost confusion. War, bloodshed, provision, want, famine, pestilence were abroad in the land. My attention was then called from the scene. There seemed to be a little time of peace. Once more, the inhabitants of the earth were presented before me, and again, everything was in the utmost confusion. Strife, war, and bloodshed, with famine and pestilence raged everywhere. Want and bloodshed caused pestilence, and then men's hearts failed them for fear, and looking after these things which are coming on the earth. Now, I kind of want to share a little bit of, of uh, 
what's going on in Israel. And this is just firsthand based on my friend who's there. He sent me this text the other day. He says, regarding 700 missiles, he said, they are bombing us again. He goes, there are missiles coming from different direction and most of them are being intercepted in midair. He goes, our windows are rattling because of the compressions from the explosions. You can hear sirens for miles and miles echoing throughout the city. There are jet fighters and helicopters patrolling certain parts of Israel right now. They also have the military and police patrolling different areas in town. They are actively looking for terrorists. Also, car alarms are going off left and right, and kids and women above me and below me in my apartment complex are screaming and crying. I can't sleep. Every time I get to sleep, I hear more missiles coming our way. It's a war zone out here, he says. Israel killed 20 more key people today in in Gaza. We are completely surrounded by enemies in all our borders. It's a whole different world out here. And he ends it with this. December 31st can't come soon enough. What did I get myself into? When did you attend? Wednesday. Oh, this is current. Yeah, this is Wednesday. This past couple of days. And then we, we on and on, we were going back and forth. He gave me more and more in deep detail. So the question that I had in my mind, how did Israel get to this point? Why is there so much confusion? Why is there so much war? What's going on? Right? So there began my journey. So it all starts with Josiah Litch. We read, in the fifth trumpet is believed to have introduced the Mohammedan delusion and the time of its sounding to be divided into two periods. He says, the first developed into to the general spread and establishment of the Mohammedan or Mohammedan religion or Mohammedism. The second to the wearing out and tormenting of the Greek kingdom under the Ottoman and his successors, but without conquering. Do you understand what he's saying there? Under the fifth trumpet or the first woe, Mohammedism took over and, and pretty much tormented the whole land in this area. And as he tormented the whole land, he went on and tormenting and ravishing, but he never really conquered it. He never really took possession of the land. The period of torment was to be five months, which was 150 years, beginning when the Mohammedan powers of the Ottoman Empire was composed, and they had a king over them, and began under him their assault on the Greek. Does anybody know the king, name of the king? No, the king of the Mohammedans? Look it up in the Bible when you read it. Pretty interesting name. But from the time of Muhammad to the days of the Ottoman, they were divided into various factions under different leaders. Othman gathered those factions and consolidated them into an empire, himself the chief. That's his name, but the Bible gives it a different description. Second, the sixth trumpet changed the nature of the war carried between the Turks and Greeks from torment to death, political death, which was to take place at the end of the five months or the 150 years. That the 150 years began by a simple invasion of a Greek providence by Othman in July 27th of 1299. That the, term, the termination of the 150 years from that date, the Greeks voluntarily parted with their supremacy and independence by virtually acknowledging that they could not maintain their throne without the permission of the the Muhammad or Mohammedans. Thus, from that time, the Christian government of Greece was under Turkish domination and about three years after fell a victim to Turkish arms. But what termination of Ottoman power were to, ex were to expect in view of the, of the manner of the origin of the Ottoman power in Constantinople? Most certainly, it was reason from analogy, a voluntary surrender of Turkish supremacy in Constantinople to who? The Christian influence. In other words, you had this power of the Ottoman Empire going around. First, they, they, they uh, uh, tortured people to the point where the Bible even describes that the men that they were torturing were seeking death, but death fled from them. To the point of conquering them and to the point where they even conquered all the Christian nations. And the Christian nations gave up their power to the Ottoman Empire. But by the end of the 391 years and 15 days, which is another prophecy, that came to an end and the Ottoman Empire fell under now the protection of who? The Christian influence. 
What is the history of the Ottoman power for the last year? The Sultan has been engaged in a quarrel with Muhammad Ali, a, a, a Pacha of Egypt. The Pacha had rebelled against his master. The Sultan declared his independence and conquered a considerable portion of the Sultan's dominions together with his fleet. These he refused to surrender. This is important, okay? This is very important. We have to read and understand these things in order to understand where we are today. The port, in order to, con to counteract this pretense of Muhammad, has deemed it necessary to publish a manifesto laying before his subjects a statement of affairs from the commencement of the quarrel up to the present period and proving to them by the, clear the clearest arguments that the Pacha himself is the enemy of the region and that the object of his aiming is or at is to dethrone the Sultan and warning them under the severest penalties against receiving and circulating the doctrines he, Muhammad, is preaching to them. If we can give any credit to the sincerity of the Sultan in putting forth this manifesto, he did consider his throne in danger from Muhammad. The truth is, the Ottoman power of Constantinople was important and could do nothing towards sustaining itself, and it has been since the 11th of August entirely under the dictation of the great Christian powers of Europe. Nor can it longer stand at all. Then they hold it up. Finally, the London Morning Herald is tight when it says that the Ottoman government is reduced to the rank of a puppet and that the sources of its strengths are entirely dried up. What is the point of all this? You know, from the foreign extracts, it appears that the Sultan felt his weakness and most gladly accepted the intervention of the great Christian powers of Europe to assist him in maintaining his empire. So in conclusion, he says, I am entirely satisfied that on the 11th of August, 1840, the Ottoman Empire, according to the previous calculation, departed to return no more I can now say with the utmost confidence that the second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked, and they say it to his shame. It was important for me to present this to you, the first or second woe. Here's my question to you. What happened to these people? Oh, they're still there. They're there, and if they gave up all the territory and they gave up everything, the Ottoman Empire, and they give themselves to the, the Christian European nations, what is now the responsibility of the Christian European nations? Is to give them a territory or to be recognized as a state. Okay. Let's look. I want to give you a little bit of Bible just. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So often we ignore the spiritual aspect of God and focus on the physical. And in 1 Kings we read, But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hollowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among thy people. Do you think that took place? That most definitely took place. That happened. And everyone knows that the Jewish nation continued to disobey God and rejected Christ as their savior. So Bible prophecy students and teachers are alike have their eyes firmly fixed on Israel, eagerly watching and waiting to see what is happening there. These people base their end time beliefs purely on what is happening in Israel. Is that right? They do. But are they looking for the right signs? No. So now, I want to get this. Uh, I'm in the middle portion of the study, so no, we know we know what happened to them in the early 1800s, and how they lost all their power and they were fighting amongst themselves, and then how the Ottoman Empire saw its demise and.
gave its power and control over to the, to the European Christian nations, and now the European Christian nations had a job to do. They had to recognize these people as a state somehow, some way. Let's look at the, over, uh, the overview of the territory of Israel. The significance of the designation of these territories as occupied territory is that certain legal obligations fall on the occupying power under international law. Under international law, there are certain laws of war governing military occupation, including the, the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907. This is just how many years after the Ottoman power gave up their allegiance, 60, 70 years? And they still haven't been able to deal with this issue. And the fourth Geneva Convention. One of those obligations is to maintain the status quo until the signing of a peace, there's that word, a peace treaty, the resolution of a specific conditions outlined in a peace treaty or the formation of a new civilian government. Israel disputes whether, and if so, to what extent it is an occupying power in the relation to the Palestinian territories and as to whether Israel Israeli settlements in these territories are in breach of Israel's obligations as an occupying power and constitute a grave breach of Geneva Conventions and whether the settlements constitute war crimes. In 2015, over 800,000 Israelis resided over the 1949 armistice lines, consulting nearly 30% of Israel's Jewish population. And so that you kind of give you an insight the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 are a series of international treaties and declarations negotiated at two international peace conferences at the Hague and the Netherlands, along with the Geneva Conventions. The Hague Conventions were among the first formal statements of the laws of war and war crimes in the body of secular international law. A third conference was planned for 1914 and later rescheduled for 1950, but did not take place due to the start of World War I. What problem do you see? Here it is. You have the Ottoman Empire who gave up their powers over to the Christian nations, and now the Christian nations up to this time have not been able to do anything with, this, with these people, have not recognized them as a state. They're trying to regulate Israel, that land and territory, dividing it and, and, and doing all these uh, uh, divisions, and they can't come up to an agreement. And here we are into the year, uh, this was in 2015, but we are now in 2019. Do you see what's happening in Israel? Do you see what Israel is being accused of? They're being accused of crimes of the territory that they were given, where, in 1948? Has been expanding and growing and growing, moving here, moving there, little by little taking over the territory. Do you have any idea of what's going on in the Middle East? In 1949, the armistice agreements, it says are a set of armistice agreements signed during 1949 between Israel and neighboring Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria to formally end the official hostilities of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, and established armistice lines between Israeli forces and Jordan Iraqi forces, also known as the Green Line. I'll get a little bit more into that. It also outlined in the commitment to peace and stability in the area, their opposition to use the threat of force, and retaliated their opposition to the development of arms race. These, last, these lines held until 1967's Six-Day War. See the issue? that you see growing and that we're always taught. And why the um, Eastern question has brought on so much confusion because this is what happens when we do Bible study. When we do Bible study and we talk about the, the first woe, the second woe, and we always end at the sec second woe where it ends in uh, 1840 when the Ottoman Empire, and then we totally ignore it. We totally, totally ignore it to the point where what's going on with that issue today. And, and because of that, Satan has been able to bring up such a strong delusion in the Middle East that most of Christianity is going to be drawn in to this conflict. And it's going to be 
such a great deception in these last days. And all I'm trying to do is, is I'm trying to fill in the gap. And we will see. I want to give you a little history. In 1916, right? In 1916 and 22, they tried. They tried to outline uh, areas to designate these people as a state. There was three proposals for the post-World War administration in Palestine. The red line is the international administration proposed in the 1916 Skies Picot Agreement. And dashed blue line is the 1919 Zionist organization proposal at the Paris Peace Conference. And the thin blue lines refer to the final borders of the 1923 and 48 mandatory Palestine. Now, I want to ask you a question. What if you were part of these people and you're like, you're over there in the Middle East, but you don't have a country? You were probably born somewhere and you've been promised that you're going to get because you fell under the European Christian nation that they were going to take care of you and divide it. And you're waiting and you're waiting as leaders. Now the Skies Peacock Agreement it was a 1916, it was a secret treaty between the United Kingdom and France with assent from the Russian Empire and Italy to define their mutually agreed spheres of influence and control in an eventual partition of the Ottoman Empire. The agreement was based on the premise that the triple entry would succeed in defeating the Ottoman Empire during the World War I and form part of a series of secret agreements Contemplating its partition. Do you see what's happening here? And the Peace Paris Conference, also known as the Versailles Peace Conference, was the meeting in 1919 of the victorious Allied powers following the end of World War I to set the peace terms for the defeated Central Powers. So now you have a people in the Middle East who are just being torn left and right. They're being threatened of being divided to fall under different controls of different Christian nations. And in 1937, another proposal. The first official proposal for the partition published in 1937 by the Peel Commission. An ongoing British mandate was proposed to keep the sanctity of Jerusalem and Bethlehem in the form of enclave from Jerusalem to Jaffa, including <coughs> Lida and Ralme. An enclave is a part of territory or a state enclosed. In other words, they were trying to give these people this little red spot right there. You see that? A little red spot surrounded by other nations, other nationalities, other peoples. Do you see the anger stirring up in the hearts of these people? Do you see how these Mohammedism or, or uh, Muhammad, how they rose up in the, in the fifth trumpet? And then after the 150 year period, they rose up again. And this time they went around conquering and conquering till they were defeated. And now these people are uniting again. Do you think they're not going to rise up again and pick up where they left up? People, this is serious. This is really some serious issues that we hear on the news. And me going back and forth with the, my friend in, in Israel, he, says, he tells me, he says, they are not telling you any truth of what's going on over here. Right? Yeah? You are not getting any truth. Did I tell you, the Peel Commission that this is talking about, formerly known as Palestine Royal Commission, was a British Royal Commission of Inquiry headed by Lord Peel, appointed in 36, to investigate the causes of unrest and mandatory Palestine. Really? Which was administered by Britain following the six month long Arab general strike in what they call mandatory Palestine at the time. Then we move on to 1947. Another proposal per the United Nations partition plan for Palestine. Here we go again. You can imagine these people are being shaken back and forth. Right? An assembly resolution 181 in 1947 prior to the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, the proposal included a corpus uh, uh, Separate, what is it? Separatum for Jerusalem, extraterritorial extra crossroads between the non contiguous areas and Jaffa as an Arab exclave. There you go again. 
The United Nations Partition Plan for Palestine was proposal was a proposal by the United Nations which recommended a partition of mandatory Palestine at the end of the British mandate. On 29th of November 47, the, United, the UN General Assembly adopted the plan as a resolution, 181. The resolution recommended the creation of independent Arab and Jewish states and a special international regime for the city of Jerusalem. Is Israel considered a state? Or the Jewish nation considered a state? How about the Arab? Are the Arab people considered a state? Right? The partition plan, a four-part document attached to the resolution, provided for the termination of the mandate, the progressive withdrawal of British armed forces, and the delineation of boundaries between the two states and Jerusalem. Part one of the plan stipulated that the mandate would be terminated as soon as possible. The United Kingdom would withdraw no later than 1st of August 1948. The new states would become into existence two months after the withdrawal, but no later than October 1st in 1948. The plan sought to address the conflicting objectives and claims of the two competing movements, Palestine nationalism and Jewish nationalism, or what we call or consider Zionism. That was the plan. But what actually happened? A mandatory Palestine showing Jewish owned regions in Palestine as of 1947 in blue, consisting of 6% of the total land area, of which more than half was held by the JNF and the Pika. The Jewish population increased from 83,000 Two in 1922 to 608,000 in 1946. What is the JNF? It's the Jewish National Fund, right? This is very interesting. This is like, this blows me away. And this is all just, Lord, what is, you know, just praying about this. Previously, the, G the Jewish National Fund previously was founded in 1901 to buy, listen to this, to buy and develop land in Ottoman Palestine, later the British Mandate for Palestine, and subsequently Israel and the Palestine Territories for Jewish Settlement. The JNF is a non-profit organization. By 2007, it owned 13% of the total land in Israel. Since its inception, the JNF says it has planted over 240 million trees in Israel, it has also built 180 dams and reservoirs, developed 250,000 acres of land, and established more than 1,000 parks. In 2002, the JNF was awarded the Israel Prize for a Lifetime Achievement and Special Contribution to the Society of the State of Israel. So pretty much basically what these people did was as early as 19, way when all these talks were going on, and when they were distributing, these organizations started buying up land in Israel. And I saw a documentary years ago, and I was watching and listening that what these people would do was they sent crews out there. They bought this land, and all they did was send out crews, and all they did was plant trees, plant trees, plant trees. You know, you see trees. And in a matter of time, they brought what was a desolate land, they brought it, and they were flourishing it. They were making it more desirable. And the, the pika, is the Palestine Jewish uh, Colonization Association, commonly known by its uh, Yiddish acronym, PICA. It was established in 1924 and played a major role in supporting the Yishuv in Mandatory Palestine and later the State of Israel until its uh, uh, disbandment in 1957. So there's war going on with these people. What actually happened? The Jordan annexed West Bank in light green there, and the Egyptian, Egyptian occupied Gaza Strip in dark green after the 1948 Arab and Israel War, showing the 1949 armistice lines. So in other words, none of that took place. Now you have more hearts being troubled, more hearts being stirred. The Jordanian annexation of the West Bank in light green was the occupation and consequent annexation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, by Jordan, formerly uh, Transjordan. In the aftermath of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War, 
During the war, Jordan's Arab Legion conquered the old city of Jerusalem and took control of the territory of the western side of the Jordan River, including the cities of Jericho, Bethlehem, Hebron, and Nablus. At the end of the hostilities, Jordan was in complete control of the West Bank. Well, there goes that plan. Do you see the frustration, the anger that's stirring up in the middle? What did Ellen White call it? The spirit of war? In 1967 and 1994, we're getting close to our present time. During the Six Day War, Israeli captured the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and the Gol Golan Heights together with the Sini Peninsula. Later traded for the peace for peace after the Yom Kippur War. In 1980 and 81, Israel annexed East Jerusalem and the Golan Heights. Neither Israel annexation nor Palestine claim over East Jerusalem has been internationally recognized. So the status of Jerusalem is disputed in both international law and diplomatic practice, with both Israelis and Palestinians claiming Jerusalem as their capital city. Now you can see the excitement that went on here recently when, what did our, uh, our president decide to do? Yeah, but he moved our embassy and, yeah. So do you see the issue and the struggle and the war is to be recognized See, the Ottoman Empire that is existing there still is still fighting for its recognition and is promised that it was given back then. Remember what the angel said about the third world? He said, woe to the inhabitants of the earth when this takes place. The dispute has been described as one of the most intractable issues of the Israel-Palestine conflict with conflict, conflicting claims to sovereignty over the city or parts of it and access to its holy sites. The main dispute resolves around the legal status of East Jerusalem and especially the old city of Jerusalem. While border agreement exists regarding the future Israeli presence in the West Jerusalem in accordance with the Israeli international recognized borders. The majority of the United Nations member states hold the view that the final status of Jerusalem should be resolved through negotiation and have therefore favored locating their embassies in Tel Aviv prior to a final status agreement. However, in recent years, the international consensus to abstain from expressing a viewpoint on the city's final, uh, final status has shown signs of frailty with Russia, the United States, and Australia adopting new policy positions. Furthermore, the proposal that Jerusalem should be the future capital of both Israel and Palestine has also gained international support with endorsements from coming from both the United Nations and the European Union. Present time. Under the Oslo Accords, the Palestinian National Authority was created to provide civil government in certain urban areas of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The Oslo Accords are set to uh, of agreements between the government of Israel and Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO. Remember them? The uh, also uh, one accord signed in Washington D.C. in '93, and the Oslo or also Oslo Accord, the second one signed in Tabah, Egypt, in 1995. The Oslo Accords marked the start of the Oslo process, a peace process. There's that word again aimed at achieving a peace treaty based on the United Nations Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338 at a fulfilling the right of the Palestine people of self-determination. The Oslo process started after a secret negotiation in Oslo resulting in the recognition by the PLO of the State of Israel and the recognition by Israel of the PLO. As a representative of the Palestine people, and as a partner in negotiations. The Oslo Accord created a Palestine Authority tasked with limited self-governance of parts of the West Bank and Gaza Strip and acknowledging the PLO as Israel partner and, and permanent status in negotiations about remaining questions. The most important question related to the borders of Israel and Palestine, Israeli settlements, the status of Jerusalem. 
Israeli military presence in and control over remaining territories, and Israel's recognition of Palestine's authority and the Palestine right of return. You know, we see all these things happening over there, but what do we have happening here in our country? You know, you have the Mexican, not Mexicans, I can say this. You have the argument they're saying, Oh, wow, the border used to be on this side. You know, they're like, oh, wait a minute. You know, they're talking about borders. And then you're talking about, well, this land doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to the natives. You know, and, and uh, it's kind of a little mini picture of what's going on in the Middle East. The Oslo Accords, however, did not create a Palestine state. Present time. After Israeli dis disengagement from Gaza, does anybody remember that, watching that on the news? I do. After the Israeli disengagement from Gaza and clashes between the two main Palestinian parties following the Hamas electoral, vic electoral victory, two separate executive governments took control in Gaza and the West Bank. The Israeli disengagement from Gaza and the dis dis disengagement plan implementation law also known as Gaza Expulsion, and Hitnaku Kut, was the withdrawal of the Israeli army from inside the Gaza Strip and dismantling of all Israeli settlements in the Gaza Strip in 1905. I, I still remember watching that on the news. It, it was like, I didn't understand it, but it looked pretty, pretty sad. As, Despite the dis dis disengagement, the Gaza Strip is still considered by the United Nations, international and human rights organizations, and most legal scholars to be under military occupation by Israel. Though this is disputed by Israel and other legal scholars, following the withdrawal, Israeli has continued to maintain direct external control over Gaza and indirect control over life within Gaza. It controls Gaza's air and mer and maritime space and six of Gaza, Gaza's seven lands crossings. It maintains a no-go buffer zone within the territory and controls Gaza's population registry. And Gaza remains dependent on Israel for its water, electricity, telecommunications, and other utilities. This is Israel today. Where do you see the Ottoman Empire? In Galatians, we read, there is neither a Jew nor Greek. I just want to remind you that there is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ. And if ye be in Christ, there are, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to a promise that we're going to uh, possess the land of Israel. God no longer respects a Jew or the flesh, but anyone, whether Jew or Gentile, who comes to Christ is chosen of God and is a son of God. Whoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So is it true that the New Testament mentions Israel, but this is no longer the physical nation, but it is spiritual Israel. Anyone who comes to Jesus becomes a spiritual Jew. In Romans we read, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, one which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. For some reason, these plain verses are ignored by Bible prophecy teachers and students when they come to the physical nation of Israel. Jesus also says that salvation is of who? Of the Jews. Now, if the Jews accepted Jesus, then they would have still been the special chosen nation. But because they rejected him, then this statement of Jesus is applied to the spiritual Jews. In other words, anyone who comes to Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, salvation belongs to them. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, literal Israel, and given to a nation, spiritual Israel, who brings forth the fruits. But see, modern Christianity doesn't understand this. The church, spiritual Israel, now replaces the literal nation of Israel as the chosen people of God. The Bible does not prophesy that there would be a little or a temple rebuilt in Israel, or we, the church, are that temple that God is rebuilding. Do not be deceived. Search the scriptures for the truth. Before I get into this, 
Here is the closing matter of what's going on in Israel. A.T. Jones, he writes, in the 44th verse of the angel, the angel says of this king of the north, the Turkish power, now connecting this with what Thomas preached when he was here. I'm going to try to make a connection here. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make a way. This was accomplished in the Crimean War when Russia from the north and east warred against the Ottoman Empire. And the latter was saved only by the support and power of Great Britain and other allies. We studied that. We looked into that, right? Did the Great Britain and their allies, did they faithfully execute helping these people? It doesn't look like. And now the last verse of Daniel 11 tells of two events that all of Europe, this was written back in 1896. It says, tells of two events that all of Europe is constantly expecting to see and which are certain soon to take place, he says, namely the expulsion of the Turkish power from Constantinople and the wiping out of the Ottoman Empire. These are the words of the angel as to this looked out for event. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his place between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. You look at this. Map. And when do you see the king of the north on this map? When he is expelled from Constantinople, we, we, read, we read here that Constantinople itself is between the seas. But this does not meet the word of the angel. No, but he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. This can no be, be or be no other place in Jerusalem. Even now Jerusalem in the Turkish and Arabic is called the holy. It is certain therefore that the seat of the Ottoman power will be removed from Constantinople and will finally be planted in Jerusalem and then it is just as certain that the power comes to its end. In order for this to happen, what must take place in Israel? What's that? The removal of Turkey. The removal of Turkey from Constantinople, planting itself in the holy place of Jerusalem, means something to the Jews. It could mean the annihilation. Look at what else he says. It will be the annihilation of that territory. Yet this is not all. The angel continues. And at that time, when this is taking place, when is this taking place? Right now, before your very eyes. Do you see Turkey in the news everywhere? Everything that it's doing? All its movement? She says, at that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall come a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So you see what happened in the fifth and the sixth war. They came under control of the European Christian nations. And the Christian nations pretty much um, abandoned them, gave them promises back and forth that never came true. What do you think these people are doing now? They are uniting. How are they uniting? They are entering in all kinds of nations. What tool do you think these people are using to enter and invade all these nations? Immigration. Open borders. My friends, um, the signs are all around us. Whether the Turkish power shall leave Constantinople and when, whether it shall wipe out, be wiped out, and if so, when? These are great and interesting questions, hence the Eastern question, and multitudes are anxiously studying them, but of far greater consequence is the question, what will happen when these things are accomplished? The word of God is that at that time there shall be such a time of trouble upon the earth as never was since there has been a nation. 
This we have seen by positive proofs is the very thing which the great nations are dreading. And against this universal woe of worldwide war and tumult, the great powers are holding the Ottoman power as long as possible as a bulwark, knowing that when this bulwark should have been broken down, an appalling torment must be spread over all. In this matter, the word of God and the word of the great powers of the world are in exact and perfect accord. I just showed you what's going on in the Middle East. I just showed you how this Ottoman Empire is coming back into control and power. You're hearing it in the news all day. You're seeing how, what tool they're using to enter all the nations and all the countries. You see what it's doing here in the United States. You see who is in government in Congress now. You see how they're speaking. You see how the laws are being implemented and how the people are begging for seconds. Conclusion, who is ready for this? This time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. He asked who? You know David, that angel that held back, that came from the east and held back the four winds of strife? Well, they're about to be let go. And guess what? Nowhere in God's word do you find that angel holding those four winds again. They were held up only once. Whoever on the earth is not ready for the spreading over all nations of such a time of trouble as never was since there was a nation who, where whoever on earth is not ready for this is not ready for the wiping out, Josiah Lynch says, of the Ottoman Empire. If such a tragedy took place right now in the Middle East, what do you think all the nations in the world, the world would have to do? We would go into such a time of trouble and war. It, it, it's, this is what apparently Alan White wrote about that she saw. Therefore, instead of the churches and pulpits and religious papers calling for war and urging the wiping out of the Turkish power off the earth, they would, they would better, far better, be preaching the gospel of peace which they profess and which they are so basely perverting and by the sincere preaching of the gospel of peace be preparing to stand in peace in quietness in God when this time of trouble shall break upon the world at the time of the ending of where? The Ottoman Empire. So who is doing this work? Who is ready for the time of trouble. This is my last slide. For this is not simply a time of great trouble by war amongst the nations. It is a time of trouble caused also by the judgments of God upon the earth. Followed quickly by his coming. Amen? The resurrection of the dead. Amen? And the ending of all things. The phase of the question is emphasized by the third portion of scripture which treats of the Ottoman power. The 16th chapter of Revelation contains a record of the seven last plagues in which is filled up the wrath of God to be poured out upon the earth. All I gotta say, my friend, is I was really perplexed to present this. And, and just my closing thoughts is just this simply, you know, we know what happened to these people. We know what these people are. We know what the news is feeding us and, 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 and uh, um, the hostility presented by the news if we watch it and if it has an influence over us is given us even so-called Christians who preach the gospel of Christ of peace of salvation even unto them. But that is not the spirit that we are getting within us when we see what's going on over there because Zionism is teaching us to defend um, and I don't want to sound uh, like a, an anti-Semitist, but over the you know the dispute over land between the, the Jewish people and and the Ottoman Empire of today. But we are being fed food for the mind. We're going to be caught up in this woe, and if we don't know the truth of what's and why this is going on, we're going to be caught up. We're going to receive the plagues. 
So the Eastern question of the King of the North coming down, what I just presented to you pretty much is just the end result of what will take place. I don't know if this is something that I should have preached on the pulpit on the Sabbath, but it is in God's word. If I was to open up the Bible and I would read it from the Bible, that's what the angel gave John at Patmos. So it's very important that we do the work of the three angels' messages here. Amen? Amen. So with that, can we, those that can, please bow with me and as we close the prayer. Dear Father, Lord, I, I really pray, Father, about this. And, and Lord, sometimes these messages are not easily received, but Lord, it is your word and I ought to keep you happy rather than men. And these are the things that have fallen upon the world, Lord. And we have been given this information through inspiration in these last days. I just pray, Father, that these things do not bring fear, does not uh, do no such thing other than just bring awareness to us and cause the signs of the times that we are in to reflect upon our lives and, and realize that time is coming to an end soon. We ask you now, Father, to be with us and to continue to bless our fellowship this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please turn to hymn number six, 362.